so welcome Simon and Jost from from Spotify, one of the fastest growing uh, brands on this planet. And you guys, you're responsible for high velocity experimentation there. So we are really happy to have you at the Growth Marketing Summit. Nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the flattering words. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's how it is. Um, and yeah, you, you've done uh, incredible uh, presentations at, at Google and at Conversion Jam about your experiences with setting up these um, teams and how it is organized. And I think people in Germany will love to learn from you. Uh, what does it mean? So we appreciate that you're talking very open about that topic. Um, Let's dive into it. Sure. Um, the first thing um, I understood from your talk is that your job as, uh, let's call it conversion or experimentation people, is to understand all your stakeholders, which I also think it's a very, very complex thing. You, you have your product teams, you call them R&D. Uh, I learned that. Um, you have whatever brand people and tech and developers and so on. So why is it important? Why, why do I have to understand all these stakeholders? Because all these stakeholders have their own agendas and have their own kind of mirror to area where they are experts in. So when you come there as an experimentation team, mm -hmm. you're kind of like touching a lot of these areas where these people are actually responsible for. So for example, when it comes to design, and you come up with designs within your team to like do a certain test. Yeah. In the beginning, they are often like, why are you doing this? We are the designers here. So instead, by understanding their agendas and kind of enabling them to test more, you make them more your ambassadors instead of that you make them somebody that's tried to work against you. And that's what we've been trying to do with a lot of the other teams as well. So for a lot of the other R&D teams, or product teams, okay. if we want to call them, they often had this issue like, okay, why are you guys testing on our domain? And instead, like, well, we think this and that. And then they think our hypotheses are good and our ways of working are good. And then they actually want to test with us instead. Mm -hmm. So instead of us trying to convince them in the end to uh, to do our test, we run tests with them. Sounds, sounds great, but you also call what you're doing high, high velocity um, experimentation. Um, how does it match? Because being aligned with so many stakeholders that there are thousands of people working at, at Spotify. So doesn't that slow you down? I think it's kind of like two paths that we follow. So we have some mm -hmm. paths that really does take much longer, like some of the bigger tests that, for example, Simon has now been very involved in in the last couple of months. And then we have the other paths, which are much higher velocity testing. So we're trying to solve for both paths to a certain extent. So that we that we do the bigger tests, which are more political and involves a lot of teams and a lot of sync meetings and a lot of stuff. But we're trying to keep on doing the high velocity testings on the side. Yeah, the small experiments that we able to show that we get small wins and kind of build the trust within the organization and get buy-in from the different stakeholders. Sounds sounds great. Will you be able to share some of your experiments and, and their results in, in your presentation? <coughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool. I, I am sure people will love to see what, what's going on there at Spotify. Um, so basically, I get it. You have to build a report to your, your stakeholders, understand them, do experiments with them, not against them. Actually, how do you do that? So I, I think one of the most important things is like like often when you start a zero team with an organization, you are kind of assigned there for, for example, marketing or from mm -hmm. sales and marketing. And they are kind of the people that bring in you and like, hey, we need to do this and we need to do that. So like in the end, it's important to take a stench against everything that everybody is saying and try to be seen and perceived and also act like it to be independent so that you're not, for example, slowly becoming a cms system for, for example marketing so like we've both been consultant and we have seen so many companies that uses like a b testing tools just to drive different traffic to campaign pages and that's in the end what a lot of like ceo people are actually doing in that company to do that kind of stuff and also this kind of things happened before at, at spotify so for us it was really important to like hey we only do we only try to do tests we don't try to do any kind of 
specific marketing campaigns for people and we really try to learn stuff. So all our tests should be based about like, hey, we want to learn something and it should be implementable for real afterwards. So it should be, be able to put, put life in production. If we cannot put it live in production, then we don't want to do it. But it, it, that means basically what you're saying that every conversion optimizer, growth, whatever, engineer, uh, however companies call it, if, if your position is already part of a silo, let's say marketing or um, analytics or whatever, then you're already biased and you're maybe not able to build that relationship with. Yeah, with for sure. Other. Yeah, but so we are really aware of that. And what we're trying to do is not come up with all the ideas ourselves, but rather because Spotify is currently live in 79 nice. markets and mm -hmm. it's really hard for us to know like, what are the like cultural differences in like, for instance, India and what payment methods are important there. So we work with the local conversion managers that driving campaigns have a lot of local knowledge about payment methods, about the culture and trying to bring in that knowledge and then try to develop experiments together with them. But how do you make sure that there's still a, a high quality of experiment design? So when it's a high, high velocity growth engine, however you call it, um, it means you you would still suffer from a garbage in garbage out uh, problem. Yeah. So if all these experts are distributed, you actually cannot make sure that they deliver a great experiment design that drives results. How do you do that? So we still try in-house to design all our experiments. Our designer is following the normal design grids meetings. So meaning that this, the, the weekly meetings with all other designers, where they go to the designs that he actually made and people comment on it. So even though they are not the showstoppers and don't try to like influence them in that way, like, hey, we want you to do this or that, we still get like a fairly high quality of our design just because of purely this process. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't slow us down as much as it would be in real, like 10 years R&D process or product process where it would take months to come up with a proper design that is then proper fetted and everything. We don't want to slow it down that much, but we do want to get the feedback from other designers. So we have a lot of feedback sessions there for, for example, mm. to getting that getting that quality in there. Um, so generally, like as Simon said, we're trying to get our IDs from all over the organizations. And I think it's just really, really important to fight against this siloed ID. Um, and one way that, that we have done it, and I, and I think succeeded fairly well, is by by being kind of also the funnel experts, meaning that like really often in a silent organization, people only look at their little part of the puzzle. And we are really trying to to try to enable to to see something from the beginning of a journey till the end of the journey. And, and that's how people kind of see us and why we are not seen as that siloed as some of the okay. other teams are. But is, is it like you're kind of owning that funnel or is the R&D team owning the funnel or <coughs> is, it, uh, is it owned by everybody? How, how do you make sure? Because I see, in a, especially in traditional companies, it's important uh, which um, team's idea was it and there's always a struggle. How do you make sure that this doesn't happen? That's a good question. So yeah, every single product team or R&D team, they own their specific slice of their like website. And we're working with all of them to try to have that holistic view. So we're from a business. So we're part of the business organization and we're trying to improve the business, not a specific, specifically the checkout or the account pages or whatever step in the journey. So we're trying to have that holistic view and make come up with the experiments that will make for instance, just check out better and then attribute that success to that team as well, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not trying to to steal their ideas and we're happy to mm -hmm. test for them. So we, we're not really trying to do that at all or going away with their credits. So let's say, for example, in, in the checkout, we have done quite a lot of testing with different payment methods and different orders. And then in the end, we were like, in that sense, it's still, although it's now fairly big organization, fairly humble, 
it's not necessarily like okay that's our like our ideas that actually initiated that because it's normally it's not it's very often the local knowledge or the people that work with it daily that come up with the real id and then we vet the id and we design the id and then we go with the r d like hey guys we want to test that and then they're like okay that's probably like a really good idea and maybe we can build that into something proper afterwards and maybe even make it uh make it different or we base our future designs on that so that's kind of how this whole process work so we see we see our like design of like our testing as a as a like a feeding mechanism into r d where they should focus their efforts on sounds cool i i listened to your um uh talk at google as i said and um the only thing that I was wondering is maybe because the last interview I had with um, Els from AG Consult about user research, you were talking about your your kind of team setup for your experimentation team. You say you need to be um, kind of autonomous uh, when it's about your um, team setup. So you have your own developers and designers, and you work with copywriters and data scientists and so on. But I didn't hear user research. How is that organized in your company? So I think it's really important <laughs> for us to be autonomous when it comes to execution of our day-to-day -day work. But okay. we're working in a large organization where we can utilize like localization and translation teams. We can utilize user researchers. So we have a couple of labs around the world with set up for user research. And we work together with those people within the organization either like just having their like research and reading it or we're participating and asking them questions for or they will ask questions on our behalf and investigate different things but we are actually uh, on that note we are actually looking for an um, so this talk is going to be in the first september right so then yes. we have our, our our <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah this year will be difficult um and then we are actually looking for an intern uh, user researcher and see if that speeds up speeds up the process so maybe we will actually try to have that in-house or inside of our team as well um but right now like as you say it works quite well with with using other teams uh, user researcher mm -hmm. it's not really a bottleneck i guess that's kind of what it is right like if you experience that it becomes a bottleneck then and that slows you down then you want to take it within your team and right now we're kind of like on the yeah mm -hmm. it's working quite well but it would make sense to maybe have it in the team sooner or later so what would you say how how customer centric is uh, spotify as an organization <laughs> tough question <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it also depends like i guess i guess it's um as an uh, as a music company it's really catering very fairly well towards the needs of the of the music lovers mm -hmm. um but i guess it's slowly also about this transition to kind of finding the second audience so mm -hmm. finding people that are, but music is not the biggest thing in their life but they still want mm -hmm. to experience music in one way or another um mm -hmm. so so like we're now trying to gear up a little bit towards that kind of user segment mm -hmm. that are less of a music fanatics as the other ones are um, that's why I also have now podcasts at Spotify and exactly. Yeah. Mm. Okay, good. But I guess that's maybe one of the biggest challenges for organizations that grow so fast to stay um, user centric. You know, I think it's easy if you're a team of five people and all of you have contact with um, our customers. If you're a startup, you're maybe going on the street on your own and ask people what do they think to kind of test in a cafe uh, or coffee shop and uh, when you get bigger and bigger the more you lose the connection to your to your customers because in a digital business you don't see them anymore and this this i think this is a tough one for for every organization yeah it definitely is and i mean of course our market position is completely different in all the different countries as well like we have of course the nordics where like well I mean, loads of people, of course, have Spotify, and then you have the much less mature markets like in uh, in Asia, in Asia, for example. Um, so we have different conditions in all of these markets. So also, like how we how we go to market and how we actually position ourselves there it needs to be quite different from from each place. Um, so when it comes to the being uh, being user centric or not, 
it's quite important to to still understand what what our users want and like if you would like otherwise you will become a text here at only company and then you would for example make a lot of um a lot of features that probably only are applicable to like the top user segment of people that already use your app instead mm -hmm. of people that are not using your app mm -hmm. and that's i think kind of like why it's really important to go out there and talk to your users and find out what your users want mm -hmm. great so um, one thing i remembered maybe let's come to the to the final topic for for today is um uh, you said it's important if you're recruiting great optimizers, they, they need to be uh, persuasive on one hand. Of course, they work with a lot of stakeholders and have to make things happen. But on the other hand, they have to be really humble. And my observation is that most uh, optimizers are people that are really driven by, I know something that makes it better. I, I find the mistake, whatever. <laughs> so, um, being humble is sometimes not the strength of optimizers i don't know what what's your take on that i think yeah as you say yeah it's that's definitely not simon's <laughs> strength <laughs> <laughs> i think that is true but if you if you would ju as an individual just point out, out wrongdoings by others or like improvements and not be humble about it i think you wouldn't succeed in large organization at all uh, and people wouldn't want to work with you or with your team. So, mm -hmm. like focusing on that, and then. Uh, I mean, I mean, this is like a Swedish company, right? In in many ways, so it's kind of fun, fun, funny to see how that works in the US. But even the US, it's like <laughs> considered to be a fairly fairly soft company in so many ways. So that means it's not very hierarchical, and there's no real hierarchy. So it's not like the job manager tells you what to do. You know, it all should come from bottoms up in a way. So if you're going to tell people all the time, like, you are wrong, I'm right, it's not well, going to work. You will have a hard time. <laughs> yeah, you're really only optimizing for the short term, let's say, like that. So mm -hmm. it's it's more about IT generation and, and finding, like, consensus there in that sense. And this is, of course, like, when it comes to both humble and persuasive, you shouldn't look too much for consensus either so that it slows you down completely. So that's why this is a very uh a balance that you really need to learn yeah that, that's that what i learned if, if there are too many people um uh working on one experiment or one concept or test hypothesis it gets weaker and, and weaker because it kind of sinks in consensus and yeah yeah often and doesn't have any contrast anymore sometimes to test the bold things uh yeah, you need to be bold as well and then persuasive because bold ideas always have a lot of enemies in, inside a big organization. Yes, and our main rule is never ask legal. <laughs> <laughs> Please Richard, give, don't, give this out of the recording. Don't tell them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we even yeah. once but, we did an experiment where the, the board, the top management board, should not know it. So it was, we called it guerrilla testing. So we used the IP addresses of the management uh, right. level and so they <laughs> did not see the experiment yeah we can tell you some about this well when the record button is off yeah. <laughs> yeah. but like Great, so. for us it's like we we have a lot of traffic so like testing one bold idea and then another bold idea and not reach consensus is of course an option for us so we you we, we we can test a lot of different things without having everyone's like yeah like to one a b test but rather like a b c d e f g maybe but we do look in general like okay is this if we for example let's say we make the whole website black with green buttons right and like is that ever going to be implemented no who would so, do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be just as an example so i mean like we do want to have some kind of idea that this could be implemented in the future for real because i think that's like also uh one of the challenges that we have as in CRO, like you do a lot of tests and then so, like, and then quite some of them actually become positive, but then they never get implemented, which is both bad for morale. Um, and also meaning that you're often then still using your, your, um, your AB testing tool for sending traffic to this winning experiment. Um, so, so that's why this is important for us that we do test that I've viable for the product teams to actually take on and to put into production. Cool. 
Sounds great. I'm sure Spotify is a blueprint for a lot of uh, organizations when it's about how to organize for growth and to stay agile. Um, so uh, we're really happy to have you at Growth Marketing Summit and to learn how you organize your, your growth uh, team or your high velocity testing. Uh, we also learn how you call it. So thanks for all the answers. And yeah, see you September 1st at Growth Marketing Summit. Yeah, we'll be looking forward to it. See you soon. See ya. See ya.